Yesterday, Dr. Agustin, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, in his presentation, in less than an hour, he pretty much described what is behind most of what's, why people are sick in America. So um, I'm wondering why is this not part of medical education? You know, I work in a teaching hospital, and um, I remember Brian when he was a scared little intern that came into our unit, <laughs> as well as Brett Schur. Well, Brett wasn't that scared. Um, but, you know, it's kind of, you know, he, all, everything that he has learned, he has learned on his own, and none of it he has learned when he was getting his training. And I'm just, you know, and he's been graduated since over 10 years, and it's still the same. You know, I've been working in the same facility for 30 years, and it's still the same. So I'm just wondering, sorry, what is, what's the block? Why is this not taught in, in their tr uh, regular training? Yeah, so that's a great question. Why in medical training, why in medical residencies do you not hear about, what, what, do, you mean by, what do you mean by this? You know, Keto? metabolic disease, you know, uh, checking an insulin, doing, I mean, not yeah. even doing a craft test. I mean, I can tell you as a, thir uh, as a nurse, I've, I've drawn an insulin level once. That's it. Yeah. Once. Well, as you might surmise, it's complicated. And <laughs> actually, the um, medical school curriculum is full. Yeah. So you're going to have to take away something to allow the you know, renegade Dr. Westman who talks about food to fix something. Oh, you want to introduce food and nutrition in <laughs> medical school too? Yeah. Oh, we're going to have to remove something from the very, very packed curriculum. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what I hear very, all the time, that they're in, their, their curriculum is very impacted already. Uh, but, you know, Dr. No Augustin, in, in, in 30 minutes, in an hour, he described like, okay, this is why there's CHF, there's cancer, there's diabetes, there's, you know, a whole slew of things that are behind metabolic disease. And he did it in an hour. I think medicine can spare an hour to explain, you know, metabolic disease. Yeah. yeah. And maybe they don't have time to teach them about nutrition and the importance of vitamins and minerals and all this stuff. But, you know, give them, you know, Give them the idea that's like, okay, this is not, medication is not going to make the problem better, you know. Oh, so. you mean you want to take away <laughs> the pathophysiologic knowledge that doctors need to use medicines? Yeah. <laughs> because that's a big part of the curriculum. Yeah. So anyway, my experience is, you know, University of Wisconsin, Madison for medical school, University of Kentucky, Lexington for residency, and then Duke University for fellowship and being a professor there for 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, I've never been asked to teach in the medical school. I had to elbow in once, and because I talked about an Atkins diet, I got a letter to the dean saying he was promotional. Mm -hmm. Even though I also talked about the Rice diet, and the Kempner diet, and the Ornish diet. So um, deans, curriculum development, uh, uh, people in charge, are they are, uh, beholden to other forces at play other than helping a doctor learn what helps people. So at Duke, for example, uh, and at, but every school is different, uh, we teach, uh, uh, you know, you're being taught by basic science researchers who think you need to know biomedical science over how to take care of a, a patient because they're not taking care of patients. So, you know, if there was one, I mean, I'm, I'm told there's going to be a Verda school. Is that right, Steve? I, I was just going to announce that Verda Health is going to have their first medical school. And this is a total joke. <laughs> total joke. But you, what you need is something to come brand new that does, is not beholden to all these other forces. And I, I'm uh, honestly, you know, something like SMHT, Metabolic Health, this group, can actually create guidelines. What you see in the literature, it, and I found this recently, the paper that says medical students get no nutritional training, and they publish a paper. 
and then do no advocacy to try to get it to change in the medical schools. So, um, yeah, so my, my NIH grant driven university, and I think many of the high profile universities are grant uh, or, oriented and are m more interested in getting more research grants than to train medical students what they really need to know. But I thought doctors just gave drugs. So, so the current practice of medicine is the medication practice and that's what medical students are being trained for in my humble opinion. Um, my experience has been that if you, it, it's a little bit political. I've actually taught in medical schools and what I've done in the last 15 years is I've had hospitals ask me to come in and talk to a group of specialists or even the general group about basically about metabolic medicine or non-traditional medicine or whatever. So I, I think there's a connection. I'm surprised that F Finney and Westman haven't been asked by many places to give lectures on this stuff. I really am. So I think a little bit it's, it's driven by the populace and saying, hey, we, we want doctors that know about this stuff. I, I, I'm bold enough to say, hey, I'll talk to these doctors and, ask, and answer questions. When I tell them about metabolic medicine, when I tell them about low-carb diets and just explain it in my simple, you know, Dr. Ben, you know, New York way, I mean, they love it. Can we do more of these? Can we do more videos? Can we train these people? So I, I'm, I'm surprised, but I'm, I'm not surprised with all the, like, like Eric refers to, all the politics and the money and the BS that happens, that it's not more prevalent. But I mean, I think we have to, have to stick our nose in there a little bit and say, you know, I'm available for this stuff. And you're going to have a couple of friends in, med in these medical schools, I think. And that's your in. You, you, it's a little bit of politics. It's a little bit about you know, getting in there. I, I think we have to be more, uh, we have to be stronger in saying, listen, this is important. Your patients, or get somebody who's got a, you know, a, a rich benefactor for the hospital or something to say, get to be their friends, which I don't find a problem. And say, you know, get me in there, man. The, the, they pull some strings. So that's, I think it's on us a little bit too. And you say, well, the medical schools don't do this. It's, why the hell should they? Okay, they, they still pay them. They still get licensed. We, we have to kind of force the issue. I'll take, I'll take two. <laughs> I, I, I'll try to be brief because I could go on and on about this. When I did my first study and showed that came up with the, the, the observation that there's something called keto adaptation. Uh, and, but I didn't know anything about nutrition because I was taught nothing about nutrition in medical school. I went back to graduate school for just one year, but of course got roped in. It's been three and a half years and learned a lot about nutrition. At that point, my, my career goal was to teach nutrition in medical schools. That's what I wanted to do. And I, but I also learned how to do the, then the fancy but very complex intravenous feeding is called total parental nutrition or TPN and tube feeding and so I worked with critically ill patients in the hospital for feeding them which was kind of the bread and butter and then I started a weight loss clinic and that made money so I could pay the process but I basically I was I needed to have an entry into the school to teach and so what I developed was it was about a 15 to 20 hour course on clinical nutrition and we covered the intravenous feeding, tube feeding, we covered basic human, some of the basics of human nutrition doctors needed to know, we covered kidney uh, nutrition for kidney disease, nutrition for liver disease, heart disease prevention, which of course was all wrong back then, but I agreed to teach it so I could get two hours out of those hours to talk about uh, uh, weight, you know, the, the, how not to try to do weight loss, which is caloric restriction and lots and lots of exercise but nutritional ketosis. And I got to do that for five years at the University of Minnesota. Um, and then they got a new dean in, and the new dean went through the curriculum and said, why are we wasting time teaching our doctors about nutrition? That's what we have dietitians for. And then, uh, so I quit and moved to UC Davis, and they actually had a division of clinical nutrition within the School of Medicine. And for 10 years, I was, it was great. I had my 18-hour course. I was teaching it, and everything was fine. And then they got a new dean in, and well, you know the story. 
And so I left academia. I just, there was no home for this. It wasn't accepted. But the other factor is why they don't want to teach this to students is there are no questions about, meaningful questions about this on the part one or two of what used to be what, the national boards and on physician certification exams. There's not, it's not on the exams. Why do they teach it? Because the problem is to get as many of the students through the exams, and you're wasting their time if you teach this because it's not on the boards. So until we get it on the boards, it's all just a, you know, a, 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 a voluntary um, uh, optional course. So who, who can we get on the board committee? <laughs> the, the board, we need someone on the question committee for the USNLE. But Steve, can I get your class? And the, uh, uh, our society will, will uh, somehow get your class material back available to everybody? Is it digital? I last taught it in 1998. So that means it's, and, it's and au courant with today. It, every, every decade, half of the material has to be, be changed because we, make, we do science and we prove old stuff wrong and, and bring in new stuff. So it's not current. But um, If you thanks, taught it you. then, it's current, current today. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Westman. You're welcome. Next question. Somebody else wants to. Um, Dr. Finney. Uh, with, in regard to the study you shared with us this morning where with Verda uh, patients lost weight in the first year and then regained just a little bit in the second year, is it possible that that was uh, lean mass gain or uh, are you fairly certain that it was uh, regaining uh, fat, body fat? In some patients it could be lean mass, lean mass gain, but uh, I would guess that the majority of the weight regain is from uh, regaining body fat. Um, what I didn't show you, I didn't tell you, but one of the slides I slipped in three and a half year data, and it's again creeping up a little bit, but not much. And we just completed the, the five year data collection, so we ran the study out to five years. Uh, and we're analyzing the data now, and we will publish it. But based on, without revealing anything, um, we will have retained more than half of our initial weight loss, which is as good as you do with uh, gastric sleeve surgery. But it's not good enough, and we're working on ways to make that work better. Thank you. This question is especially for Dr. Westman and Finney. Uh, what do you uh, make of the protein leverage hypothesis? The higher protein, lower fat version of low carb for weight loss, because I've had some patients that were stalled and for whom it helped. First, I'd, I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Soto, who's here from Brazil. Can we please? Thank you. Um, I would say the most notable, uh, popular doctor in, in Brazil for keto, so thank you for coming. Um, thank you for that. You know, I don't know much about the protein leverage hypothesis other than what I've learned recently, and I'm still kind of giving people ad lib choices, and, uh, and some people, I'll even target the social eating, habit eating, as opposed to so whittling away to a couple meals a day rather than changing the macros, which I think that's what you're talking about. So I don't know. I, uh, Steve? Uh, again, I have not seen, I'll be the grumpy old uh, the scientific guy here and, and say that, you know, if I see one year data on a, a study, it doesn't have to be a randomized trial, but show one year data that works on a significant subset of patients, um, I would be excited. Uh, until then, it's a hypothesis. Um, the other f concern I have is I don't know of any, historically, looking at cultures around the world, of any culture where if people had access to high protein, uh, low, low fat protein foods, that they lived predominantly on, on, on that kind of diet. It was um, uh, assumed that the Inuit in the Arctic lived on a high protein diet, and I've met 20, 30 years ago, prominent scientists from Sweden who did a study where they gave uh, a group of Swedish athletes like 350 grams of protein as lean steak. And, and uh, because they thought that, that was a, an Inuit diet. 
Uh, and the dropout rate, basically most, most of them dropped out within two weeks because it made them sick. Uh, and when, so if you're looking at feeding maintenance calories, so you may be able to give a high protein, low fat diet at, with caloric restriction, like say 800 calories a day, but when you get to 2,500 or 3,000, particularly for active people, if you have 70% or even 50% protein, the human metabolism can't manage that. We're not designed to do that. If you have a dog, your dog can live on 50% protein. And the Inuit, which were a dog-dependent society, that was their transportation and their protection from polar bears, the Inuit, when they made a kill, they saved the lean for the dog and they ate the fatty tissues and the lung and the bone marrow uh, and they treasured the fat and the dogs could live on the, on the lean. When, the, when Europeans, I don't want to bash my ancestors, but when European explorers went among the Inuit and they, they took Inuit along to hunt and, and, you know, for them and, and provide food, the Inuit were thrilled because these white guys <laughs> want, wanted the lean stuff and they got to keep the fat stuff. And so it was, it was great, except there, there were some, some ex exploratory parties where the, the white guys, you know, the Europeans got sick and some of them died because they were eating high protein, low fat. So I'm, you know, show me the data. I'm not saying it's wrong. I've been proven, I've proven myself and been proven wrong many times. And I'm open to that. Hey, Doc, you. Are, you, are you referring to basically Ted Naiman's kind of read on this stuff? Exactly. Okay, that's what I thought, okay. Um, I think we should be a little open-minded to um, other ideas other than just strictly keto, even though we have two keto icons up here. I mean, uh, because they get good, I've seen really good results, and again, all of us have had experience and we're, we reinforce our own success, I think. That's just the natural human trait, okay? But I have always been a higher protein than just a strictly way high fat keto dude, okay? And my people get into ketosis. But understand what Naaman is saying. I mean, there's some stuff we don't like about Ted or whatever. I have my own issues, but uh, what he says about energy, okay, energy. The problem is where do we store excess energy? I think almost more than what do you eat. I, I really think that we have to consider that as a, as a philosophical option, all right? So I have seen people that go lower keto, you know, kind of, uh, um, formation and a little higher in protein and do very well with weight loss and their markers are fine it doesn't so understanding where these guys kind of start with the people they're dealing with protein is much more of an issue than it is with the people that have to lose 10 or 15 or 20 pounds a pound just listen to Ben Bickman their insulin response is I think exaggerated because of their metabolic dysfunction so it's not the worst idea I've ever heard. Be open-minded is my point. Okay, thank you. I'm in full group. <laughs> Don't worry. I'm open-minded. Yeah. Show me the data. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, what would you say is the uh, biggest criticism for keto these days? Because, um, and I'm just asking because, you know, whenever I come to these conferences, it seems like oh, it's so obvious, this is the best diet, it, cure, it cures everything, it helps everything. But I'm also assuming there's a lot of smart people out there who don't think this is the way to go. They have higher carbohydrate diet. And I guess when I say keto, I mean more of a carbohydrate restriction strategy for improving metabolic markers. So there's still you know, a lot of disagreement going on, on Twitter at least, and outside in the academic world. And it's hard for me to believe that the only resistance is the fact that they are, they're profit-driven entities trying to, trying to keep us at bay. Um, so what are, what are all the other experts thinking that aren't here? Did you see the recent study, uh, study by the um, Physicians Co Committee of Responsible Medicine, how the ketogenic diet is going to kill you I, through I was, several... I was exposed to it in this to several different mechanisms. No, I mean, no, you see, you asked, like, what are the major things that I hear? And as a dietitian, what did I hear, like, throughout my entire dietitian training? One, it'll destroy your kidneys. Right. Two, it'll destroy your heart. Well, but recently, after a study and all these studies... Even after all of those out, studies? Right. Yeah. I mean, because there's the still same. controversy going on now. Yeah, it's it's still the same. You, you're 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 going up against 
decades of indoctrination. And I mean, there's also a saying like, be very careful, to, you know, you're asking people, I mean, dietitians specifically to, I mean, you have all this cognitive dissonance. If I, if I embrace this, if I, if I, if I um, look at this data and say this is fact, then I've been killing my patients. I've been giving terrible advice. That's a really hard thing to come to admit. And also, um, can I keep doing this? I'm in it, you know, for many acute care dietitians, like you're not allowed. I was suspended for, God help, you know, God forbid, telling someone with diabetes to attempt a low-carb diet, even after I told him, don't say anything, you know, and he got excited and told his nurse. Um, yeah, I think, I, 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 and I'll be curious to what you guys say as well, but I, it's very profit-driven. You know, we have an industry that makes millions and millions of dollars. I can't kill you. If I kill you, I lose you as a customer, but if you're well, I lose you as a customer as well. And so, and then we do, we, they, there still are a lot of studies that, you know, fiber, and, you know, fiber, and um, if LDL is too high, it'll be bad for you. So I think there's just, I mean, at least from, that's what I, from the dietitian world, that, like I said, I've presented, I took my, I took my, I took 180 clinical trials and said, look at all this data. <laughs> and they, it literally was like, oh, that's nice, and moved on. You know, go back to doing exactly what you're doing. So I think Joan nailed it, we're addicted. As a society, we're addicted to it's everywhere. And you know, asking people to give up what's making a lot of money, yeah. What do you, what, you think? Company? You think like the dietitians are sponsored by Coca-Cola, you know? And then doctors don't get the education, and then we're here begging, look at this. It's it saved our lives. It's saving our patients' lives. And but I don't know. What do you guys think? I'd be curious to hear. Well, obviously I'm biased, but I think 80 percent, if you were to put in a bucket, 80 percent of that bucket is saturated fat and cholesterol that that's the single biggest reason to not do the ketogenic diet because it's going to give you heart disease and kill you. I think that there's a bunch of other things that can get brought up, but those are the ones we hear about the most. And ironically, of course, saturated fat causing high cholesterol and therefore causing heart disease. That's why I think it's so crucial for us to be able to get uh, stronger data specific to uh, those people on a ketogenic diet and especially seeing high levels of cholesterol because Technically, a lot of the people we're going to be studying are doing everything wrong from the perspective of conventional medicine. They're high saturated fat, animal-based diet, many of them on animal-based only diet. They, it's almost a shotgun of just about everything you could think would likely bring them heart disease. Because the other thing I'm noticing is, at least in the Verta Health data, um, LDL goes up, but ApoB doesn't really go up. And... Uh, and right now, at least even in mainstream medicine and cardiology, ApoB seems to be a better marker of, uh, that seems to be a little more closer to consensus view that ApoB is a better marker than LDL for, for heart disease. And I, I, I do want to push back on that, though. I do, th like, for example, hyperresponders, the ones we're looking at, their ApoB definitely goes up. I think in, in the case of, like, the Verda, you know, the groups for which they're typically coming from obese to, say, overweight, for example, uh, it is more common that their their cholesterol levels hardly change at all to possibly get a little more elevated. Um, and, of course, Dr. Finney could speak to this a little bit more. Specifically, ApoB may hardly change to even going down. Um, but if we're talking, like, for example, on the other end of the spectrum with lean mass hyperresponders, and uh, Finney may also be able to speak to this as well, I think their ApoB is almost certainly going to be going up in the aggregate. Um, the, we have spoken, you and I have spoken about this a lot, but um, the original question was why are these smart people not coming around? Isn't that really the question that you asked? Right. Okay. We're, we're and not assuming let it's me, some sort of conspiracy. Let me give you a little parable that I tell. There's an old man on the side of the road, his knees and his hands are bleeding, but there's a big pile of dirt next to him. And you come down the road and you see this guy's digging a hole. So you, knowledgeable, beneficent person, take a pick and a shovel out and you give it to him. Show him this way that's obviously so much more beneficial. And you walk back to your car and he hits you in the back of the head with the shovel. Okay? Because you have just shown him the error of his ways. People don't want to, they don't want to go there. These are supposed to be smart people. These are supposed to be experts. It's a, it's a tough swallow. I think that's human nature. That's why this, these people don't, it's irrational to us. Okay, it's, it's hard for them. Um, I'd like to add something to that. So in, in my world, it, there's not a lot of smart people speaking for or against the ketogenic diet because I think they just don't have the experience. But the one person that comes to mind for me is Walter Longo and the work that he's done, and I applaud his work in, in getting us to understand 
the value of short-term fasting around chemotherapy, if nothing else. In my world, he's done other things too as far as the longevity. Um, but what that does is it, it gets, uh, it's like the game of gossip. So he says plant-based Mediterranean, but what my clients, when they come to me, are hearing is no meat, meat causes cancer. Uh, no dairy, dairy is inflammatory. Uh, no, oh, oh, I can't, you know, I can't have this, I can't have that. Till the point where they're so restricted in, in what they're, that they're eating because they're getting their information primarily from Facebook, from, uh, you know, from blogs of people that have similar disease to them. They listen to Chris Wark talking about his disease, but he's not, I mean, he's not an authority. But in my world, people are taking some of these, these people out there as authority because they have no leader. There is no beacon out there except for what Walter Longo has put out there. My best advice, oh, I was gonna say sugar addiction is a big reason why people aren't listening. Um, go to a class or take a class if you already haven't on how to read the literature. Become an evidence-based medicine connoisseur when you're taking your research or your information. Ignore everything except research. But, and even then you have to be able to read the research and see whether it really says what they say it does. So I go to the method section first, <laughs> the title last, and oh, if they say, you know, this, the effects of this beneficial, you don't read that paper. Any substantially, I don't know, Virta did, but any, you know, reputable group doesn't say the results in the title. You're supposed to read the paper and draw your own conclusions, but we've talked, the best thing you can do is arm yourself with an ability to read carefully and stick to the science, not Twitter, the other, other places with agendas. I agree. I think that's the next step. Thank you. Hello, my name is Nick Spriggs. I'm an attorney from Las Vegas, Nevada. I've been practicing keto for uh, about three and a half years. And uh, I'm coming at this from a little bit different angle where I see uh, a tremendous opportunity uh, for a mass tort or class action type lawsuit to attack directly <laughs> the purveyors of sugar, soda, cereal, and all of the toxins that we are poisoning our populace with. And I've been on the wrong side of the asbestos, asbestosis and silicosis cases, having owned a company with 40,000 pending asbestos cases. And I've been on the right side of the tobacco escrow cases for the companies that were downstream of the tobacco settlement that had to pay in. And so my question to the panel is, do you feel confident enough in the state of the peer-reviewed journal science that it that would in fact prove such a case? Mind you, I've. I have my own legal opinions. I'm not asking for a legal opinion. I'm asking you, would the science as presented in this conference be, be greater than a, you know, a, a greater preponderance of likelihood that it's accurate than the alternative, which is everything is fine. The status quo is just wonderful. Sugar flour and vegetable oil are virtuous. Or is that too much of a loaded question for the group? Well, my quick response is, um, there's not enough evidence. So we can uh, show the benefits of getting rid of something and um, the, the pro so I can prove that it's not fat, but I can't prove that it's sugar causing all of these problems. And to, you know, to a degree of a, uh, a jury, I think. Uh, I can, so I, not like, so remember Matlock, where the, the lawyer, found, uh, you know, exonerated his, his client, and then he'd say, and she did it. And then, you know, the courtroom, he'd leap out and they get the perpetrator. Well, I don't point think- to the empty chair. The, with, with the empty, this, it's not us. Right, so it's not the fat. Now, the science has to be funded. There's no funding. There won't be for, I don't know, 20 years to prove that beyond a shadow of a doubt in experimental evidence that it's sugar and carbs causing the problem. I, I think it's gonna take that long. But I, asbestos probably didn't have randomized trials. 
I mean, so uh, smart lawyers. And I'm, did you meet Tony Martinez? I did indeed. I yeah, met the great. other two attorneys at the conference. Yeah, so talk to him. But um, I, I'd love to help think about that. Thank if, you. If it's helpful. I would love to help think about that too. I remember um, when the study came out that uh, sugar sweetened beverages do not contribute to obesity. And when you looked at it, it was funded by Coca Cola. Um, but that was, you know, peer reviewed literature. And I remember asking the same question, you know, especially when you, when you get your health back and you're so excited. Like, what can we, can we go after people on a higher level? Can we get some high powered, motivated lawyer, maybe who's gotten their health back or whose child was really sick? And um, I was able to talk to a few people and they, they told me, and I'd be interested in what you guys think. One of the main issues, it, it would be really hard to prove that there weren't confounding factors. Like, yes, this person got sick because they ate a lot of sugar, but oh yeah, they're also really depressed or they had a major trauma or they were in a bad accident or you know they were eating other things. So they said it would be really, really hard to prove um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know what, what do you guys think? Can I throw a different angle at you? Certainly. I do wish that there was a lot of data that uh, is not accessible that I wish would be subject to discovery. And you know how, what sunk the tobacco industry were their own documents. Right. And the, that were released in the discovery process. So a good faith pleading that's filed, a good faith complaint that gets past a motion to dismiss would in fact lead to discovery and depositions, which may or may not be productive. And, and I don't want to call out any particular industry, but I'll just say that I do think that there's some data that I would certainly be very interested in if it were publicly available, and I think analysis of it would be very interesting. So maybe we could talk more offline about that. Very good, and I'm in Vegas. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's right. Good luck. My, quest my question for the panel is, do you have any good ideas of how to mobilize our cardiology colleagues? Because I think if we could get them on board, particularly about the LDL question and the great slide that was shown about the major effect of high insulin levels compared to LDL, how can we get them on board? I know we've had two cardiologists here, but their colleagues don't treat them well. and. I wonder too, Dr. Westman, with your cardiology colleagues, what, what is their take on this? I was actually about to hand it off to Eric, and of course he, he emphasized back to me this study, our study, uh, may go a long way to helping out because it, it's true. I've actually, a little bit of the backstory is I actually started this four years ago when first writing the article on lean mass hypersmotors, and I thought naively at the time that I could just take this phenotype, given how prominent it was to cardiologists or lipidologists who were researchers, and that they'd just be snatching it out of my hand, going, oh, this is great, this is great, we need to study these people right away. And then over time, I started to try to do it behind the scenes. I made a lot of connections who they thought maybe I'd be able to get some traction going, maybe we'd get NIH funding. All of that just fell apart to where eventually, about two years ago at, at uh, Low Carb Houston, I just straight up asked you know, everybody, and then went the direction of crowdfunding, and then things started actually happening. And again, a little bit naively, I thought maybe once that started going, that maybe those same people would be like, oh, you know, we should do some sister studies. It does seem like there's a lot of interest and so on. There's, there's not been any interest at all. But I do think once data is released, and, and I don't know if this is going to be the case, got to emphasize that, if in fact it does show that they are at a low risk population, I think that will potentially get the ball rolling to be able to where you would have to have a lot of interest into how this population could be bucking the trend that would be expected. So we'll see. I think to answer your question is how, what, what would be the first step? It would be, in my opinion, Arthur Agustin. Okay, somebody like that. Because he's well respected in conventional medicine or you know, the people that we think might be hesitant. That's one reason why I tried to get him involved in this stuff, because I think that guy's sold 40 million books. I mean, he's got to have some influence, no? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming he's tried, but... Well, he, I can mean, be, he can be coerced. Uh, and I, that's, co <laughs> that's coming from an Italian from New York, okay? So, <laughs> so uh, well, um, I just want to comment that some cardiologists are aware of this and actually endorse it. You use the metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance. Remember, I asked Dr. Agatston what was the most important factor. He said insulin resist resistance. 
not LDL. But in fact, um, in my area, the cardiologists, they, they want to do interventions. They're, they're doing stents and things like that. And it, the, pre the preventive cardiologists understand this, send me their patients who have metabolic syndrome. I would say nobody's on board with the elevated LDLs. And then the family medicine docs are you know, freaking out about the LDL. And I joke uh, to my patient, I'll, I'll send them a Valium prescription. And, and then I think a new, a new cartoon is, um, yeah, keto causes heart attacks, and it's in the doctor looking at the drug, te the the level of LDL, and the patient's just fine. It's the the reaction of the doctor. So we've instilled this guardrail inappropriately for doctors, not only cardiologists, and I think data will win out. In the meantime, I ask people to check their arteries directly. You don't look at tea leaves to predict. You know, blood tests are just predictors. So, and I learned this because a family friend, a family or a relative went to the hospital, had clean coronaries, had a heart cath, it was totally normal, and then he was told to do a low-fat diet to prevent heart disease that he didn't have. So if you have no carotid disease, no aortic disease, your CT scan, CAC is zero, and you go in, you have ammunition to the doctor to say, look, I don't care what my LDL is, I don't have the disease. So the first thing you need to know is high cholesterol is not a disease. It's something that we think it predicts or leads to the atherosclerosis, the heart disease. And so you arm your, your patients with the knowledge and um, I, I pretty much ignore what the other doctors say and inform my patient and have them collect new data. Uh, and, um, and then I say things like, "Why? Do, it's not your job to teach your doctor. You know, and, and I'm really impressed how some people do respond to what doctors say. Not everyone, but some people do, and they're scared. They're, they're being bullied and fear-mongered into using medicines, mainly, uh, or, or plant-based, whatever. You know, so uh, it's tough, but data will win out. I, I still believe that. And I agree the data will win out, but since I think the gentleman with the hat is not here, I'm probably the oldest person in the room now. <laughs> and I've been puzzling about this for a long time. And uh, in the, a book that somebody close to me wrote with me, uh, Jeff Volick and I, we described something we call the Warren and Marshall syndrome. And it's not the two justices on the Supreme Court 100 years apart, Warren and Marshall, but uh, there were two guys, obscure pathologists in Western Australia in the mid-1980s who had published irrefutable evidence that ulcers were caused by H. pylori. It was an infection, not just acid. And I was taught in medical school it was caused by acid. Mm -hmm. and all these drugs to reduce acid, were which, some of which caused major problems with digestion and, and you know, gut protection, etc. And they published all that data, including one of them drank a live culture of H. pylori and three days later had himself endoscoped because he was doubled over in pain. He had florid gastritis and then he took a, the, a, the generic antibiotic mix and one of the problems was it was a generic antibiotic mix. Nobody's going to make a profit on selling this stuff. And they eradicated it within two or three days. And they had all this published in the mainstream literature and I had read their articles and I was talking to the gastroenterologist at UC Davis in my department saying, you know, this is really interesting. I said, that's bullshit. <laughs> what do you think? What are you thinking? It's acid. And for 10 years after they were published, not that those papers were published, and these guys were demeaned. You know, they were ridiculed. And 10 years later, in 1994, 1995, the whole modern world changed. And the hot new thing is ulcers are caused by H. pylori. We, can, we have this brand new great antibiotic. We can cure it. And we put a lot of surgeons out of business because they weren't cutting out bleeding ulcers anymore. It saved a lot of lives, but it took 10 years. We call that the Warren Marshall Syndrome, and there are many other experiences like that. And, and actually, we go back and read the writings of a, story, or a um, philosopher at the University of Chicago named Thomas Kuhn. I'll shut up in 30 seconds. And Thomas Kuhn wrote the, you know, the structure of scientific revolutions in the 1960s and chronicled that science doesn't move forward driven by data. If they move forward, by resisting data and resisting data, and then suddenly they can't resist anymore and they give up and, and we make progress. 
And I hope we're getting close to the 10 year breakpoint. So part of the solution here is a medicine that we um, call tincture of time. And I'm hoping it's gonna happen in my lifetime. When I still believe ulcers are called by, caused by acid. <laughs> Have I got some tums for you, doctor? Because <laughs> that's the way I was trained. It was acid. You guys are the best. <laughs> Can any of you lovely people tell me if you're either contributing to or able to update us on any research that's underway using carbohydrate restriction and ketogenic principles in COVID? We have, I'm not allowed to say, okay. many more than <laughs> 10,000 patients, most of them with type 2 diabetes, uh, in treatment through Verta Health. Uh, and we have our own data collection system. Um, we track patients, and, and our coaches are in contact with these patients on a routine basis, meaning at least usually a couple times a week for people who've been in the program for more than a couple of years. And we've been tracking patients who report that they have COVID, have, have a positive diagnosis. Um, that doesn't mean we know all of, all of them. And you know, if they, if, you know, cynically, if somebody gets it and quickly degrades, you know, goes downhill and ends up on a, a vent in an ICU and dies, we may not know that. But then their, app go, their, you know, their input on the app goes silent, and we try to track that down. We have more than 500 cases of patients in our, in our treatment who are uh, COVID positive. Um, we have pretty good information on how many are hospitalized, how many were in the, on the, put on a ventilator. Um, and we're hoping to publish those data within the next three to six months. It, but it's, you know, it's, a, it's a, a passive review, it's not a prospective study. But the fact that so many patients have diabetes and diabetes is a high risk for poor outcomes, uh, we think we may at least have some, an, in, enough information that we would make it, hopefully COVID ends, but we can, could get more resources. Because you know, we're a for-profit company. We don't do, do research for charity. Uh, and so it's, it's a struggle to, to do sometimes the obvious things, but we will be, we do intend to publish those data. Okay. Um, some of my colleagues have been trying to organize something around ketone esters, but it's really hard because it's not approved for any medical purpose at all. So it's not like testing a drug where you can get it in easily enough. And honestly, I lost track of what they were doing with it. Um, but uh, there was something that was starting over at Johns Hopkins, but I, I don't recall all the details on that. But it was a ketone ester, and I know from experience, uh, for, for myself having asthma, that, um, that ketone esters do reduce the inflammation that I experience, and I don't believe it's a placebo effect at all. I had heard a rumor that there was a clinical trial using ketogenic tube feeds in the ICU with intubated patients, and I didn't know if you had heard anything about that. What? Tube feedings in intubated patients with COVID. I, I believe that was done, that is was being done in Italy, but I've not seen any. I I, I heard that it's happening. I I haven't seen any peer-reviewed data. I just wanted to add to that last point. I know you're a for-profit company, but in some alternate universe where Verda didn't exist, that window of data would have been missed. So it's just one more way in which Verda's given, some, given us more data we wouldn't have otherwise had under the ketogenic context. So I just, I just continue to be impressed with how much Verda's brought us already. Just had to say that. Well, and Dr. Finney, I did read somewhere, you know, on that misinformation internet that we have, um, that Verda da, did, there was somebody that had some of your numbers somewhere that talked about how much lower your rates for death or, you know, with people with COVID. Now, it was, I don't, I can't remember where it was, but it was like a week or two ago I read something somewhere. So anyway, I'm guessing it's going to be pretty good when it comes out. So. I mean, you can respond to that if you want, or maybe not. I was going to crack a joke, and I said, hmm, I think one of our marketing people has loose lips. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's going to look really good if any of it's true. Um, so it's been documented that people that live in the blue zones um, have periods of fasting, like no matter where it is around the world, and then periods of low protein. and kind of rotate through that. And I know a lot of people have hit on some of that, you know, here and there and everywhere, but I was just kind of 
curious about what you guys all thought about having having that strategy as a you know longer life sort of thing, not maybe outside of diabetes or any metabolic diseases, but just to like live longer. Can you say that? I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? Uh, Can you repeat? What, what two things happen? So the, in the blue zones, they lower protein and periods of fasting. You know, just to comment, yeah, the blue zones um, as a book, as a concept, is um, really not scientific. You know, it's a book. It's a. It's kind of like if you read the China study years ago. It it, it really wasn't science. It's what people wanted th to see in this description of whatever was being observed. To me, the science says keep the insulin low and you'll live longer. If you're a worm, you're a rat, you're a baboon, maybe I feel insulted human. now. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, I wrote a paper with Ron Rosedale, or should I say he collected the data and I helped him write it and it was all about the Long, uh, living longer about having lower insulin levels and he looked in his own population at patients on a keto diet and the insulin levels were all very low and if you were here for the meeting you can see this is one of the most potent insulin lowering treatments. Does it add value to have fasting, to have those changes to lower insulin levels? I don't know if that would help beyond what you're already doing. That's, uh, that's an open question. I have to get this in on this longevity thing, okay? Um, 2007 British Journal of Medicine, Ruiz and Blair, um, itemized, evaluated um, diff different uh, behaviors and conditions and correlated to longevity. The number one correlative it's in with 12,000 people in a published peer review study. Okay, so we got that covered. Um, 12,000 people, the number one correlative to longevity was muscle strength. If you are in the top third for your age and gender in muscle strength, you are 35% less likely to die of cancer and 40% more likely to live to be 100. Wow. Okay. I think it passes all the scrutiny of the panel as far as a legitimate study. Okay. Just off the top of my head, isn't that interesting? <laughs> I, th I think what Eric said about um, Blue Zone uh, is, you know, it's a, a book. Um, and if you look at it, there's so many confounders and one that keeps coming up in my world. You talk about uh, social connection. And I think like for people with cancer, the ones that feel isolated do much worse than the ones that have a sense of community. Uh, the ones, it, it may be prayer, it may be meditation, it may be a big social, you know, family, uh, whether they're related or not, but um, it seems to be in cancer, it seems to be that connectivity. And, and that's very uh, um, prevalent in the Blue Zone community. So do you think that fasting, it, the, the reason that fasting is sort of a part of that, I never read the book, I just heard somebody talking about this on a podcast. Um, that the fasting part is just the secondary to the insulin response? Yeah, ab absolutely. And I think the fasting probably comes from, uh, it's a uh, Seventh-day Adventist from what I understand. And, and so if you look back in time in the in, you know, biblical, you'll see that there's a lot of fasting uh, because that's, you get that euphoric state and the connection, the spiritual connection to something beyond you is what people experience if they have a religious belief. Can I give you a synonym for fasting? It means fat burning. Thank you. Fat burning. Yeah. Yeah. Walter Longo, with all due respect, comes from a vegetarian background and thinks the only way to become a fat burner is to not eat anything. So he believes that fasting, his approach is, you know, the only. I was on a panel with him pre-COVID, and and I tried to explain. Well, actually, on a keto diet, a fat burning diet, we're fat burning and eating and you're fat burning and not eating. So, but you, you think fasting and it's not eating. No, fasting just means fat burning. That's, if that's one thing I can teach you today. Well, of course, I'm gonna then jump down the rabbit hole of like, 
um, stem cell production and yeah, we stem probably cell have that too. And, yeah. We're probably getting that too. Okay. It hasn't been studied yet with all, you know, that's Dave's next study. <laughs> Auf autophagy. So it doesn't occur to Dr. Longo to study this because he wants you to not eat anything and then have a vegetarian thing. And I don't know why or how his once a month or once a week meal helps. I, I, it's, anyway, it's all... I'll, oh. I'll, yeah. You gotta get the bars too. So, fasting, fasting so, means so, fat burning. Just, just please, if you're going to say something, please st be at the mic because there's 300 people out there that are actually trying to listen to this yeah. offline. Okay, thanks. Did, did, oh, does Miriam want to say? Oh, okay. I definitely wanted to say before we move on something about protein because as even as a young dietitian, I was told like we can't eat meat, we got to keep our meat low, and I think this has contributed to so many problems. We have a population now that believes that animal-based agriculture is destroying the planet, it's destroying our health. Oh my God, I live in right outside of Portland, Oregon, and there's all these ethical vegans that have minimal evidence and you know two or three emotionally charged statements. And I, in all my time as a dietitian, especially Dr. Ben just so greatly said, you need muscle mass. I cannot tell you how many patients I've seen, and not even old, I'm not talking 90, I almost said 70, uh, 90. <laughs> I'm talking people 40s, 50s, who are so overly fat and under-muscled, they cannot even walk the two steps to the bathroom. And part of that is they are not getting animal, ad they're not getting adequate, um, anim I say animal-based protein that has enough um, amino acids. And I think, you know, telling people that we need to have less protein or we need to have these vegetable-based ba vegetable proteins is, is completely nonsense. I think what we need to do, which all you guys are saying, is we need to keep insulin low. We need an easy tiger, reduce, eliminate those carbohydrates, processed carbohydrates, addictive foods. But we, I think it's a tragedy that we're telling people to eat less animal protein because so much of the population, you guys, we're, you know, we're all excited and we study this stuff, but so much of the population thinks protein is just like, oh, I'm protein muscle, thank you. Um, <laughs> But it does so many different things in the body. It's for your hormones, it's for your cells. And when you eat animal-based protein, you're not just eating protein, iron, folate, B12, carnosine, carnitine, all the different cofactors that work perfectly and synergistically in your body. You can't get that in a Beyond Burger. You can't get that in tempeh or tofu or kale. That's nonsense. So don't restrict protein. Yeah. Our, I want to add something to that, too, with the animal-based protein. I have uh, a, I've worked with a lot of people who are uh, plant-based, and you know, I do my best to, to win them over to using some animal protein, because when I look at you know, that big chronometer thing that I showed with the, the intake, you know, I'll see insufficient intake of amino acids. But I never have to worry about people who are willing to eat meat, because if they're eating enough protein to sustain themselves, they're going to be meeting all of those essential amino acids. They're not going to have to be like add, uh, combining this and this in order to get this, and it's in the plant form. Sometimes it's just not that digestible or absorbable from the gut. And these people have a lot of gut issues that aren't going to be resolved for a long time, if ever, because they're in treatment, and every time their gut is maybe recovering a little bit, it's getting assaulted again with another round of chemotherapy. Hello. Um, so I'm a nurse practitioner in Middle Tennessee. We're very rural, so getting our um, colleagues to, I don't want to say buy-in, but get on the same page as us as far as a low-carb lifestyle for metabolic health. I'm curious to see if you all have a, the same response, but if there was one paper that you could choose to give to a doctor, family medicine, cardiology, to pique their interest enough to where they can't tell me it's trash and we're going to keep giving statins, what paper would you guys comes to mind? Yes. And what's the one focus again? I just want them to not argue with me that carbs are bad. Well, so the Verda paper that you've seen here would be tops. Of course, they might say, well, that's just diabetes. Uh, there are a 
couple older ones, um, Yancey et al., our paper 2004, which was a nice randomized trial and also of internal medicine. And, but I would give meta-analyses, uh, Bueno meta-analysis, Nordman, there, I think there are four now meta-analyses that don't include the Verda paper. But it, I've found in teaching some doctors want that level of data, other doctors don't, and it, it, some people won't be persuaded really. I, I find I persuade them by fixing their patients and sending them back to them. And uh, I would add that the, the difficulty with the Verda treatment is we were such, such fools we did not do a randomized control trial, which is the gold standard. But in the real world, patients choose. The doctor doesn't order them to be on a diet, doesn't randomize them to a diet that say this is a possibility and patients choose. And what we chose to study was patients who were willing to give the treatment a try which means it's not for everybody, but for that significant fraction of the population who are willing to choose it, it appears to be a, an effective tool. But we've gotten a lot of pushback because it's not randomized controlled trial. And I just looked at another meta-analysis that was published on low carbs and the, their effect, and it limited it to randomized controlled trials, so it doesn't reference our paper. So I would recommend the Cassandra Forsyth paper uh, from um, Metabolism and uh, the one of the ones I mentioned is referenced in my slide deck from 2008, where we showed that uh, the weight loss is better and all those metabolic syndrome parameters get better. Um, uh, and that was a, 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 a RCT. It was only three months long, but it's much more convincing for the skeptics. Thank you. Uh, hello. Um, just to make Doug happy, I have a nice short question. How do we stop the vegans? <laughs> Can I ask a question? Uh, and please, I hope you feel comfortable enough to answer honestly. Is there anybody here who is a vegan? Not a vegetarian, but a vegan. Anybody? OK, cool. How about vegetarian? OK, all right. Well, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Vegiquarian, okay. Okay, all right, thank, thank you. So I don't think it's a question of, uh, of stopping the vegans. I don't think that kind of a movement can, can be stopped because of the concerns over the planet and the animals, the ethical. And there's a lot of money there. There's a lot of money to be had in selling products, processed products, that are plant-based, because now you see they're all moving to that, plant-based, and it still allows them to use the sugars and the sweeteners. And if it's organic, they might call it cane sugar, but it's still the same garbage, and it's still the same companies that are ruling the show. And, you know, there's, there's no company that's going to make a lot of money off of selling whole foods. It just doesn't happen. You can't advertise them the same way. You can't position them in the supermarkets the same way. You can't get people interested in them in the same way because you don't just rip the top and eat it. You got to put it on the stove and cook it. Or you got to, or you got to, uh, you know, wash it and put it in a bowl and put something on it so, to eat it and enjoy it. So it's a, it's a whole different paradigm. And, and it's just shocking to me that, that so many people that I've worked with they don't know, like I've sent pictures of a steamer basket to people because they didn't even know what I was talking about when I said steam a vegetable, it's pretty sad. <laughs> so at the risk of having my low carb card revoked, I'm, I'm gonna say that I know some, uh, I have some vegan friends who seem to be doing well, seem to be thriving on it. I've seen their blood work. I like what their blood work looks like. I think that for many of us, there are many routes to health that aren't necessarily low carb. And I'm fully willing to embrace that. I think whatever works for you is a good thing. I think that the one thing that is fair to say is whether it was vegan proponents or anybody, I think that I do have a big problem when you're telling me what diet I shouldn't be on, generally speaking. So if you're coming from a place of authority, and it's, and it's in particular in the place of nutrition, where you feel the nutrition data sides with you enough to the point where you don't want data to even be explored 
for where it might work for me for a different diet, that's where I would definitely draw the line and that's where I get upset. But that said, I do want to emphasize that I think that there really is a lot of individuality to this. You know, there are times when I wish that there was a company that had a lot of money <laughs> that, that, that could push back and say, you know, that's libelous. That, that is actually not true, and you're threatening the income of my company. There's harm. And uh, the, because it's a big distraction in my office when someone comes in, hey, did you see the video by blah, 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 and it says the keto kills, and, you know, and, and we have evidence to say that it doesn't. And a company that had a lot of money would probably sue those people or at least send them a lawyer letter to cease and desist. And we don't have that. Well, maybe the society might do that at some point, but um, I don't want to get into that. But you know, I think anyone can be healthy. Well, many people metabolically can be healthy eating, eating a range of things, including different types of diets. I'm, I'm also of the mind that you could be healthy uh, and uh, you want to measure things, but I don't think they should cross the line to say, and it's okay if they proselytize, I, I don't care about that, but when they start calling us evil and bad and unhealthy and that's not science, there should be a way to get back and say, okay, you can't cross that line. I, I think, I, and I've been pretty tolerant for a long time, but I wish there was a way we could say, hey, you know, you cross the line because you're saying that our stuff isn't science and it is. So, Eric, I, I, I volunteered across the line. Uh, you, you're on the board of directors of that society, I think you were referring to. So, um, let's, so let's talk let's, to some of the board members <laughs> of the society. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's could, do could that. I, could I make a comment based on basically epidemiological evidence? And this, this is serious. It's yeah. going to sound funny. But in about the early 1920s, two Brits, um, Oren Gilks, and one was a, a physician and one was a surgeon, so one was doctor and one was mister, went to Kenya and spent a year studying the people who, living, who were living in the Great Rift Valley. And this was back at a time when the Maasai still lived a, a pretty much a pure version of their uh, highly evolved herder, nomadic herder lifestyle. But they weren't the only people living in the Great Rift Valley. They lived up in the, in the, the, on the hills and graves on the hills and were nomadic. But down in the valley, the, uh, the, the Kikuyu people, and I've not been there, so I just read what they wrote. And you know, they were Brits, so they probably had some racial bias. But it was fascinating, because they did um, anthropomorphic studies, body size and, and um, um, you know, waist to hip ratio and shoulder size and so on, and looked at dentition in these two groups of people. The Maasai lived, the women did eat some gathered food, but particularly the warrior males in the Maasai, once they uh, uh, reached puberty, the ones who were selected to be in that, that group only ate animal products. That was part of their culture. Um, and uh, they grew very tall. And the Kikuyu people were subsistence farmers and almost pure vegetarians. And uh, when they looked at uh, people in uh, early adulthood, so in their 20s and 30s, uh, the Maasai males were about eight inches taller than the Kikuyu males, and the, their shoulders were broader than their waist, whereas the, the Kikuyu males, their uh, waist was broader than their shoulders and had bad dentition. Um, and it was a long report. It was never published in the peer-reviewed literature, but it was uh, uh, yeah, the British uh, Royal Publishing House uh, had a, a long paper on it and so on. I am told that now that the Maasai have been actively and aggressively moved out of their, their ancestral lifestyle and into villages, the children of the, of the Maasai are now the same height as all the other children in the school. Uh, in Japan, at the end of World War II, or before the start of World War II, the average Japanese male was five feet five inches tall. In like 1990, the average Japanese male was, was five foot 11 inches tall. The change has not been, you know, they, say, they had less food availability, but before World War II, they were actually, a very, there was no food insecurity in Japan. 
but it was a diet that was high in carbohydrate and most of the protein came from fish. And fish oil is not a growth promoter. We've seen that in babies. When you give fish oil to babies that because they, their livers can't make long chain high, uh, omega-3s, it suppresses their linear growth. Their CNS development and their behavioral development is great, but it suppresses their growth. You have to give babies arachidonic acid to grow, and that's in breast milk. And there's a ratio of arachidonic acid to DHA, which is not fish oil, but people oil, the predominantly what goes into our brains and our eyes. Um, there is a, a proper ratio, and when we put that into infant formula for, for um, uh, premature babies, they grow at a good rate, and they, their uh, neurological development is excellent. Um, and so the, uh, the assumption has always been that, you know, that, that the height is a genetic thing. But when you look at identical twins versus fraternal twins, which is where they came from, the genetic twins are within half an inch of each other, and the fraternal twins are maybe two inches apart. It's not six-inch difference. Um, and so an terrestrial animal products, the membranes contain arachidonic acid. It is not bad. It's dangerous when you have too much of it, but if you don't have enough, you don't grow well. So if you want an argument for people to feed their children animal products, tell them they're going to end up being short <laughs> if they don't. I just want to say one more thing on that. Um, and right now, like once again, like you know, your question was, what do we, what do we do about the vegans? And I'm with Doc, Dr. Um, Westman and uh, Dave. That I think, I think we, we do have to be, at some degree, we have to be open. If somebody's thriving and they, they don't have any negative metabolic markers, and that's, that's what they want to do. Like, more power to you, right? But um, the Academy of Nutrition, once again, the governing board of all dietitians, which controls all dietitians' education, my education, my continuing, um, continuing education, their current statement is that a vegan diet is complete throughout all stages of life, infancy to death. So just something to think about. As the only person in the room who admits to being vegetarian or vegetarian, I just what, what is vegetarian? We were thinking so you scuba dived and ate. We pescatarian, sure. but the ratio be much more about vegetables than about nutrition uh, than about uh, fish. So literally just flipping the ratios. Um, I think the original question was more about how do you engage vegans to get on this journey, and. One of the things I would love to try and see is just much more inclusivity. I think there needs to be a recognition that people make choices, not just on nutrition. A lot of vegans could be incredibly informed on nutrition and the relative benefits. There's also religion. There's also issues with farming practices. And I, I hear the work that Peter does on beef specifically. It's a fraction of the system. And grass-fed is single digits of that. There's the entire poultry system, which is double the size of the beef system. And those people making choices on more than just nutrition, they're not dumb. They're making their form of protest on a bigger agenda or a different agenda. So I think in order to get others to join the nutrition store, the nutrition part, we need to bring them in with answers for them and whether that's embracing them by giving them alternatives on ready-made diets or whether it's not ridiculing them in a room and whether it's removing the meat and the dairy so they actually come to the meeting or removing the bacon from the back of the t-shirt. It's not a particularly welcoming environment where people can come and actually talk. And to the point on like cooking, 70% of food right now, 70% of food is packaged. The vast majority of people cannot buy grass-fed beef. The kind of fish that I would like to buy costs $27. The stuff that people can afford is 11 I have money. In reality, people go buy the tin of tuna. There needs to be an expansion of this, and which requires relaxation of some of those criteria so you can actually bring people in the room. It's, it's an echo chamber. So, thank you. I, th I think your point... I think your point is really well taken, and I think that there's actually a lot more in the so-called Venn diagram, if you will, in that a lot of people who are certainly keto or even carnivore would like to um, have less cruelty, if you will, in the process of how the animals that they're using for their food would be raised. I would love myself, Doug, if there was, for example, more um, talks on that in particular, 
because I think that's something that there could be a lot of bringing together communities to be moving forward to. So again, I think your point's well taken in that we you know, should be seeing the forest for the trees. So are, are you suggesting that, and, and I'm not making a judgment, that this community should be more accepting? Seriously, I mean, uh, yeah, okay, I, 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 I uh, yeah, yeah, no, that's, 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 I agree, that's, that's, it, it's ignorant, it's ignorant to, because we accuse those people of demonizing us, and then once, no, I, I, I agree, that's just, it's ignorant, it's silly, um, but, and it depends how we have this debate. Okay, but to welcome you in, you know, and I'm an old, you know, conservative dude, okay, but yeah, we got to welcome people. We, we can't demonize this stuff. I mean, Brian and I did a study with one of my guys who's a physical specimen. I mean, he's a kid. He's 27 or whatever. He's a vegetarian, okay? He, as, a, as one of my employees, he teaches low-carb and, you know, animal-based diet, but... We, we, did, we tested, how the hell is this kid maintaining this much muscle mass, right? Where's he getting this protein from? Uh, and we, he obviously does, and it works for him. Nicest kid in the world. Um, but no, you can't, once you start getting in, and I, I even told Sean Baker, you know, who I know reasonably well, I said, Sean, stop, this is stupid. You're an, you're an intelligent guy, which he is. I said, you let these people get to you, so you, you're starting a street fight with these people? That, to me, that's just... That's below us, and we shouldn't represent that as an organization, that's for sure. Yeah. I think, I think we should stick to the science. And to the extent that someone can come in and scientifically talk, fantastic. But I've been in meetings of the Obesity Medicine Association where people were not scientific, and it took the, the bandwidth of the meeting away from science. So uh, there has to be some care with which to allow uh, the debate to be, or the discussion to be pushed. I mean, that's Twitter, that's, that's other. This organization should be science-driven, in my opinion. Can, can I also just mention one more thing? There's also some like Carrie Dayulis who is on a ketogenic diet, but it's plant-based. Um, and I would love it, for example, if she were a speaker uh, at some of the conferences we go to. So just, just again, there's more in the Venn diagram middle than we may realize because that is something we should be looking for. We should be seeking it out. So again, I, I applaud you for your point. Just on the science, couldn't agree more. I'm actually a scientist by training, which is probably why I'm here and why I do eat animal products. Um, it's going to take too long. Today, one to three percent of people are already vegan or vegetarian. Among millennials, that number rises to 12 to 15 percent. It is the fastest growing food trend. It overtook keto for the first time. But By the time the science comes, point. it's going to be late. So we need to get people to something in between sooner and faster. And Don't by the way, for me, one of the very exciting spaces is the microbiome because of all the evidence that shows how microbiome switches between the two different ways of eating. Could be something there. Could be something there. I just want to say something. There is a difference between plant-based vegetarian and vegan. Oh. And I think vegan is where it, it's almost impossible for me to work with somebody with cancer who is vegan because they, it will push them out of ketosis. They can't be in ketosis unless they're tiny. I have worked with some very small people who only, you know, who only need 40 or 42 grams of protein because they're four foot nine or 10, but that's not the norm. The norm is that they need more protein and that pushes them out of ketosis. So that's my, that's my position so on it. Low carb is a whole different thing and, and vegetarian yeah. is a whole different thing. The way I would do that is by getting the vegetarians to join ketos and have the vegetarians tell the vegans. Right now, we're pushing ourselves too far apart. We need to start bringing some of those groups in. So. How would you like to be on a committee? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sign me up. We'll change the nutrition labels too, so I'm in. Uh, thank you all so much. This is a great topic. So while we're here debating keto versus vegan, 
Uh, two million Americans will die of diet-related diseases every two, a million Americans will die of diet-related diseases every two years. We just learned from Michael Moss's new book and a cooperating study that Americans are eating 67% of their calories in processed foods. Last year, for the first time, I was invited to speak at one of the plant-based summits, so I watched some of the other presentations, and they're talking about very similar improvements in health when people go from a processed diet to a whole plant food plan. So I, you know, I, I know Chef AJ. She's a leader in that whole plant movement. I know you guys. And in my wildest dreams, we do come together and realize that our common nemesis is the processed food industry. And just really stop the debate about plant-based versus keto. I, I love your slides. I love the science. I love all the numbers. And yet I know, as we know from the FETKE experience, that there are there is a religious movement out there, you know, promoting, pre pretending to promote vegan diets on the basis of health, which is just not true. It's a religious belief. So I would call on this community. I think I could get Chef J. I've talked to Chef AJ about this, and we've had this conversation. Could we unite around the addictive substances that are being sold as food in this country. We have, we've seen plenty of evidence that a low carb food plan is the best, but it's not like there's low carb is the best and then there's everything else. Like a plant-based food plan versus the processed food diet that most Americans are on right now is, it's like they're over here. Keto and a whole plant-based are way over here. And then the average American diet is way, way, way down there, not even over here, it's way down there, killing American, a million Americans every two years. So if anybody wants to start like a, I don't know, a conversation. I, I know the people in the vegan world and I'm ready to broker that. I... No, there's no question. <laughs> I definitely think we can all agree that processed foods are a problem and that seed oils are a problem and that sugar is a problem. I guess my, my further um, issue with veganism, and there's, there's, this is studies, this is not my beliefs, these are actual clinical trials. You're statistically more likely, especially as a young person, to have a stress fracture because we know that the calcium and kale and chard and things are just not absorbed very well. You're statistically more likely to have a B12 deficiency, an iron deficiency. Like I said in my presentation, iron is that the highest mineral um, deficiency in the world, 25%. If you're um, five or under, it's 50%. You know, um, what else? There's there's just so many there's so many issues around that. So if you like like if you can show me the science, you know that it can be done. I think it, it makes it much more difficult if you're going to be a vegan or even a vegetarian to have to get all those amino acids. I mean that's why culturally, if you look back through through history, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but there have been no vegan cultures. People always ate animal products when they were available you know plants were so plants are so different now you, you know bananas and fruits and things were so tiny and they had almost no carbohydrates such you know you ate the meat and the fat and the organs because that's where all the nutrition was and i also think we we accept that all species have a species specific diet you know we we have like a mini zoo at my house we have a tortoise and chickens and you know dogs the tortoise is very different than the dog than the human and i think as we've moved away from what humans eat and that certainly includes processed foods all, all on board with that. But I also, just this is just my, you know, I obviously have the clinical trials with the stress fractures and the deficiencies, but what I've seen in my experience in the hospital, and I'd be curious what you guys have seen in your practices, is that when people, even well-planned plant-based diets, and, and mostly in females, maybe it's different in, in men, I've seen pretty dramatic um, decrease of bad results, pretty, pretty, you know, severe fatigue, severe depression, you know, weight loss to where it's a big problem, so. I'm open. I'm open to discussion on that. 
You know, what, why do humans want to find the one best diet for everyone? The one size, why? Why, it's human nature, why? I was, please answer. <laughs> well, I don't know why. No, and, I was, I was going to go to a similar place in that it's a shame to me that we spend so much time focusing on our differences as opposed to like, yeah. I can eat 80% fat from olive oil. I can get my 10% of carbs. We're talking about 15%. It's a less, it's a small proportion of the diet. And of that, if I need a very specific other ingredient, tell me what it is, because I've just sat through presentations of 500 milligrams of sodium making all the difference on my daily diet of 500 grams. We're talking even a well-formulated keto diet has a 1% ingredient difference for making it work. I'm pretty sure we could work with vegans and vegetarians to come up with a definition of we're 99% the same, or maybe it's 90% the same, but you absolutely have to make sure you get your B12. You absolutely have to make sure you get these things. And I recognize there's a whole other conversation around supplementation. Um, but it just seems such a shame to fight from here and here when you're already at 90% before you talk protein. And I think we can get much closer. Well, if it's science, I think there will be progress. If it's religion, you know, um, we still have religious issues on this planet. <laughs> so oh. I think having an organization that's, I mean. Let's go get the ones for, and again, it's like, why jump to the conversation on the exception? Why not have the conversation with those who you can actually bring on board yeah. and build the consensus and not start with the extreme cases? I think the reason it's brought up is that it, there are tactics used that are very effective to make this false choice. Mm -hmm. and, and it's hard to, hard to fight money and tactics. Well, I think we should bring on board the, the Impossible Meats and the other companies that have got real money behind them. There's a bunch of very rational, big budgeted people there who I think we could get pretty close in the space of five years. So I wouldn't give up yet and entrench ourselves. Uh, no, I have a dog saying, get off. No, no, no. So yeah, no. Well, yeah, you were kind of dominating it for a bit, but but a bit of great conversation. I think it's something you know. It's a conversation we need to have. So, Kim, since you snuck in there, I was no, 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 no. Stay. You still got some time. But I just. I just wanted to try and give some of the live stream people a little bit of a chance to, uh, to ask some questions since if you'd been standing there for a while I would have had to let you go but <laughs> you, you try to sneak in. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a director of quest? D you uh, just wait. So I just had a really quick comment which was um, I think we can all like a, a fight is defensive if you can find somebody right before you raise some very valid points with them you're always going to get further and I think this conversation right here that we are having is really important I, I guess I just wanted to get up and say like I talk to people all the time and if I prove them wrong in my mind or in the conversation before I hear where they're coming from they may very well be wrong but if I make them wrong if I show them they're wrong they don't see that, they just are stronger in their argument against. So for all of us who have a naturally aggressive nature, myself included, that want to fight first, I, just, I guess I just thought it was good to back up to say, Dave is good at this, right? Find the way somebody is right before you show them the ways that they might not be seeing all the things they need to see. So I just wanted to say that. Okay, babe. Okay. Christian. Is this on? Can you yeah. hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much. Um, we've, I've got a couple of related questions. So they're from two different people, but I'm going to ask them together. So they're not for anybody in uh, specifically. They're in, in general. For um, somebody who has lost weight and is pretty lean doing a ketogenic low-carb diet, what is your normal recommendation for um, consuming more that isn't going to affect their insulin resistance. For example, uh, one of them was general, and one of them is specifically for a woman who is a female, mid-50s, recent menopause, pretty fit, muscular, very active, 
high protein, low carb, does resistance training, sprinting, and all that. So they're maintaining lean muscle, but are, are still weighing less than they'd like to. Would you add fat or? Well, um, that's a complicated question. Yes. But we wrote a book about it. Huh. <laughs> it's called End Your Carb Confusion. So Amy Berger and I wrote a book out just this year that will answer actually all those questions. Um, but the short answer is, what, that I give in the clinic, um, but if you can't come to the clinic, get access to the information in the book, um, is that you want to eat to satiety of the foods that are very low in carbs. And uh, as long as you're um, um, doing that, it, then it becomes a matter of maybe you're not you, what, how do you define a goal for weight loss and a goal for weight and all that? So it's, it's a complicated question. In my experience, many people think that they're too skinny when actually remember that photo from 1970 where everyone was skinny? So uh, family members are saying, oh, you're too skinny when actually they're even heavier than people were in our country 40 years ago. So there's a lot of issue there too. But I find if some, if you get to eat meat, poultry, fish, and shellfish, and eggs to satiety, some vegetables and leafy greens, uh, uh, it, it's pretty much automatic. So and yes, you can gain weight on a low carb diet, um, but uh, then we, we adjust expectations. So. I'm understanding the question that this person is lean, they eat well, they're healthy, and they want to weigh more. Is that kind of, is that a reasonable interpretation of the question? Can you say that one more time? Yeah, someone just interrupted her just as you were trying to ask her the oh, question. So. Pammy, did you hear what I'm saying? Oh, Can you say it one more time, Dr. Ben, please? Uh, so this, this gal is lean, she's healthy, she's doing keto, but she wants to weigh more. Right, she, lost, she lost 30 pounds and has very low body fat now, but I think, and still trying to gain or maintain lean muscle, but she, I oh. think she feels like she's too light or maybe losing muscle, maybe even. No, well, that's a different question, I think, Eric, than you answered. Um, yeah, she, she has to increase protein and make sure that she works at a level that's going to induce uh, protein synthesis in her muscles. I mean, she wants to get more muscle is what I think the question is, right? 15 minutes twice a week. Yeah. No, but I'm saying, no, I mean, she has to, she, uh, <laughs> yeah, you write a book about possibly. it. Possibly. Um, no, but if, if she wants to gain lean muscle, she has to ensure, that there are three things that contribute to gaining lean muscle. One of them is protein, okay? There are growth factors, um, and here's where it gets a little tricky because insulin is a growth factor, and, you, and it helps to grow muscle. So if she's healthy, I would keep, you know, keep track of her insulin. She's healthy, she has to probably work at a higher level of resistance, or she, genetically, she may not be capable, in which case she, you know, she's pounding her head against the wall. So I've seen that happen pretty regularly, and, and, she, and, and if, if you're describing a person who doesn't want, does not want to get fatter, okay, well, that's a, it's a tough uh, process. I mean, muscle comes on um, you know, readily slowly at that age, and she's obviously doing something right now, so it may, not, it may be genetically inhibited, but she's got to make sure she's getting enough protein, make sure she's recovering, because you said she did a bunch of stuff other than, okay, that, that's a major problem. So you're, you're a little bit of an exercise addict, and in, in a soft way, hopefully, but sometimes they're just not recovering, and they can't grow muscle, because that takes some time to respond to. The protein synthesis takes some time. So that is what I commonly see, is that they're doing too much what they consider exercise, which doesn't allow for that stimulation of the, of the really uh, protein synthesis kind of exercise, high intensity exercise, to come to fruition and to adapt, adapt upwardly. That would be my suggestion. And Dr. I've handled ben that a few thousand this. times. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'd like to agree with Ben. Thank you. <laughs> that is, that's probably true in many cases, but I, you know, if you practice medicine and see thousands of patients a year for many years, you realize there are exceptions, and it's very hard to have a unified response. But I will tell you, I've dealt with some women who um, uh, 
had reduced lean body mass, and when I tried to figure out why, and, and I came from a time when we could actually say we had them in a study and put them in a metabolic ward. And there were a number of cases where we had women who, for whatever reason, were potassium depleted. In one case, it was a woman who was surreptitiously taking a diuretic, a potent diuretic, so to try to help her lose, keep her weight down so she wouldn't be swollen or bloated. And she was significantly hypokalemic, low blood potassium. And she was also sarcopenic. And when he got her off the diuretic and gave her enough potassium, in the meta metabolic ward, we saw her gain uh, six pounds of lean body mass in, in about four weeks. And we, I tried to publish that, and I was told it was impossible. The other factor there is that when you're sodium restricted and you, you're eating enough potassium, the sodium restriction induces the renin angiotensin aldosterone system that causes the body to try to cling to sodium by excreting potassium, and that too causes sarcopenia. And if, if, that, if it's an electrolyte imbalance, that can be um, uh, effect very effectively treated, but it takes a physician who's sensitive to that. And, you know, I can't be her doctor and I can't give you specific advice. Yeah, but, but, uh, he's right, Steve is right, muscle is 78% water, so if your electrolytes are off, that can, and you, you know how quickly you can lose water weight, well, you can put it on pretty quickly if you, if you organize that. that that's a, I didn't think of that, but that's a great possibility. Good job, Steve. <laughs> we, we actually demonstrated in positive nitrogen balance, not, not just water accretion, but, you know, yeah, they added nitrogen as, as protein, and, and with that came the water. But it was true lean tissue. It wasn't just, you know, take, taking two Motrin, shutting off sodium accretion, and gaining four pounds overnight, which pisses off some of my patients when they, we didn't tell them they shouldn't take Motrin because it makes them retain water. I'm uh, going to get my low-carb card revoked again. <laughs> Uh, but just, I just want to say this, again, getting back to individualization, I also have known some carnivores who have gotten to being very underweight. They are like next to zero carb. They're super satiated, and it's hard for them to even eat past their satiation, and have seen some success with adding back some healthy carbohydrates. Don't, just don't take it off the table. That's all I'm saying. It's, I, I feel like a lot of times... We get kind of caught up with, hey, if this is good, then this, a more extreme version of this is even better. I definitely know, likewise, some carnivores that are absolutely thriving like crazy, being as low a carb as they can be and are like muscle bound, doing fantastic. But the problem I feel like is too often we look for the one or two examples in our lives and then we try to just emulate them too specifically alongside kind of feeling like we need to belong to the tribe. And when it comes down to it, don't forget it's about your individual results and don't be afraid to experiment. That's just my two cents. Yeah, I just want to follow so, up real quick on, on what Dave said, because I've seen that a couple, you know, I have a pretty active Instagram account. I've seen that, and specifically in women, I've seen people who went from being very, very sick and potentially, you know, overweight to having amazing results on an all animal zero carb diet. And then all of a sudden, like you said, they, they lose too much weight. And so often what we do, um, you know, when things aren't working is we, you know, carnivore heart or paleo heart, you know, they do it, they go, like double down and things get really poor, but it's almost, it can be scary because they remember, you know, my health was so bad when I was eating all these carbs, but you know, it's, it's, it's scary to go back. And I think you made a great point, like, oh my gosh, people are gonna judge me. You know, it's like you're eating all these, the, the, <laughs> you're sitting with, you know, even with dinner, you know, there's, there's no carbs. So it's like, oh my God, what if I was that person that had to, to had to bring a carb. So I would encourage that person to, to you know, they're an N of one. If, if, if this isn't working, I think a small amount of carbohydrates can be really beneficial to a lot of people. In the form of like a sweet potato or a... In the form of whatever your body does okay. does great with. I'm a, okay. you know, I'm an endurance athlete. My wife makes long fermented sourdough. Oh my God, it has gluten. But you know, I've tried, um, I've tried, we've tried sweet potatoes, we've tried lots of other things and it just didn't settle well in my system. So I, I would encourage people not to be you know, overly afraid or overly dogmatic, and um, yeah. I, I have a question for the panel about creatinine in this situation. Do you think because it hydrates the muscle, from what I understand, would a few grams of it, three grams of it, maybe make her feel better about her lean body mass? Creatine or creatine? Uh, creatine. Did you mean do you mean creatine or? Creatine. Okay. I'm sorry. I mean, my experience with it is that it does increase uh, the, the water volume uh, 
in muscle and you can put on weight. But again, this person sounds to me, and again, what would, like the N of one is, you're right, it's, it's, there, there sound like there are some behavioral, um, social issues involved. And I think it, it's, the answer might be that we don't have a good answer. Okay, so uh, there's a couple that are going to switch topics, and I was thinking, let's see, Dave, you had the mic a minute ago, so I'm going to let Dylan ask this question about, that he tried to ask you when you were up. Um, he's curious about your thoughts on the recent discussion um, between Tucker Goodrich, Paul Saladino, et cetera, revolving around linoleic acid. Do you agree that LA is the main oxidized fatty acid in LDL particles contributing to the atherosclerosis and heart disease? I mean, just in general, and I'll, I'll first of all concede that um, as much as I like to get into lipids, and particularly lipoproteins, the degree with which I feel we can make some very strong assessments on this, I feel like the science is newer than a lot of people realize it is. We do know enough to know that um, the more a lipoprotein, particularly with like a lot of in vitro studies, the more a lipoprotein has uh, double bonded um, uh, fatty acids as part of what it's particularly like um, the um, uh, phospholipids, uh, but th that it can potentially get oxidized a lot easier. And so the more that there are PUFAs in your diet, potentially the more that filters into ending up in the lipoproteins. I realize I'm getting a little bit geeky here, but that it does mean that there will be more likely a chance for oxidized LDL. And yes, I, I do think, and I've talked to Tucker about this, that that may also be one of the influences as to why there could be lower amounts when you're having higher levels of PUFA in your diet. Now, the one place where I think I may disagree with a lot of people is I think it's a dose makes the poison thing. That's what I think so far in that I don't think any amount of you know, PUFA in your diet beyond the absolute essential amount is therefore bad right away. Um, I think that there's certainly something to be said for having a very large quantity in your diet, particularly if we're seeing, um, as some research suggests, that there's more and more uh, these PUFAs not only in our lipoproteins, but actually our cell membranes compared to generations before. That to me is kind of surprising and does kind of concern me. In fact, Finney talked about this a little bit earlier, how that's also, it provides a greater potential for oxidation uh, reaction on the cell membranes as well. So yes, I do think a diet high in linoleic acid could be problematic. I do agree with Tucker to some degree on just having uh, large amounts of seed oils in your diet could be problematic. I just don't know what that dose makes the poison level is. Nobody else wants to add? Okay, good. Um, there are two questions by the same Dr. Clara Trian. Trian. They are we in relation to starting a low-carb ketogenic diet and whether there's some influence on the immune system where maybe white cell blood counts in a healthy person would go down in relation? They say, quote, unquote, normal range, but around slightly below the normal range, example, around 3.1. And at the same time, she also experienced personally some inflamed lymph nodes that she didn't know were related to the diet, or they could have actually been an infection. But Steve, did you have? Sure. I've um, actually published data in 1990, uh, 1983 uh, in the group of lean, healthy males fed a eucalor ketogenic diet. And they were all very healthy, and they, they were physically uh, very well trained, and they had a white count, cell count of around 5,500, whereas a lower limit of normal back then was considered 4,500. Uh, the upper limit of normal was, uh, the, well, actually they've changed it now, so it was 5.5 down, and, uh, and the lowest was 4.5, now the highest is 10.5. Anything above 4.5 is considered healthy, it's not associated with, with significant disease risk unless you have some abnormality in white cell function. So if you have normal white cells, and you know, in cancer patients, we don't worry about them getting, you know, being at serious risk of infection unless their white cell counts, total counts are under 2,000. So there's plenty of room there. 
the interesting thing is I demonstrated in these guys that over six, or I was over four weeks of the well-formulated ketogenic diet, there was actually a borderline statistically significant reduction in their white blood cell count. But they didn't go below normal and none of them got infected. That didn't mean if we did it in 1,000 people, we wouldn't see some infections. But I have not seen any cases of that would, would unexplained severe infection or sepsis uh, in, in thousands of patients on a ketogenic diet. And maybe I've been, had a scotoma and I've missed it. Um, so I don't think that there's a significant risk with a modest reduction, even in the lower end of the range. In our IUH study, I didn't emphasize it, but we had a statistically significant reduction in the total white blood cell count in the diabetes patients. Um, and it, it came down about 0.8 of the units, 0.8 uh, times 10 to the ninth cells per cubic millimeter. Um, and that is not a bad thing because they started in the seven range. And it's known from uh, starting with the um, um, uh, uh, the heart disease literature that uh, white cell counts in the normal range, in the higher end of the range, are associated with inc increased risk of, of uh, heart disease. And uh, from the Framingham study, they came up with a number that for each one unit increase in the normal range, your risk of heart attack increases by 17%. Oh, wow. So having the it come down in the normal range is, is not harmful. I can't explain the lymph node observation. Oh, one of the observations in, in my son's, he was pretty strictly ketogenic diet as a child. Uh, and one of the observations of his oncologist was that his white blood cells had dropped. And that was brought up at a conference I went to, Adam Hartman, Eric Kossoff. They questioned me on his, they wanted to know about his blood counts. And I said, well, they are lower now. And Adam said, but robust immune system? And I said, yes, and that got me thinking. And there is a paper somewhere about the, uh, the white blood cells and that they may be a healthier population when they recover. And I think that's also something Walter Longo, I don't know where those graphs went. I wish I had pulled them off at one point. But he had some graphs on his fasting mimicking diet page there. The prolon, prolon, FM, and D. Uh, and it showed the, the, the drop in the white blood cells after fasting and then the recovery. And I know that there are doctors that follow that, integrative doctors that follow that information. And that's what they're looking for. They're looking for the point where it comes down, but then the recovery. And, and the belief is, and I don't know how you test this, um, that it's a more um, uh, healthier white blood cell. So I don't know. Is there a way to test that, guys? Um, I'm, I'm sure there are, but I don't know. But we do know that for um, particularly the granulocytes to work in, as an acute attack against invading microorganisms, they have to go through an oxidative burst, and that requires optimum mitochondrial functions. So if you have mitochondrial dysfunction, and in your white cell, the, the, the white cells aren't as per, per unit of uh, number in the blood, they're not going to be as effective. So, and we do know that, that uh, we have evidence that, mi that mitogenesis is improved uh, and mitochondrial function is improved in people f uh, uh, when they're in the state of nutritional ketosis. Okay, thank you. Let me um, find the next question because I had included two together. So let me see what the next one. I'll just read this without having to try to clarify it. So could you, some, one of the panel, talk more about elevated glucose level? <clears throat> um, I don't know if there's a typo. Hang on a second. Elevated glucose levels. Causes weight almost three years in a ketogenic diet. Elevated then the first and second year in ketogenic diet. I'm not reading that right. Could you talk? I'm sorry, Millie, I didn't understand your question. Yes. Is, is this is a question that people who are on a prolonged ketogenic diet see their fasting glucoses uh, uh, creep up? Is that above, I yeah, up so. the, yes. above the normal range? Yes. 
Well, I, I, I addressed that yesterday in my uh, presentation. Uh, they call it physiological insulin resistance, if that's what this question is about. And it has sort of been rebranded as uh, adaptive glucose sparing. And uh, it's a trend that I see a lot because I am tracking people's glucose levels quite closely. And the original thought was that it had something to do with uh, spikes in, in cortisol, like in the dawn effect in people with diabetes. But I, I don't see that much of a spike. I really don't in my clients who um, uh, are ketogenic. But I do see that trend upward. So it might have been like around 80, and now it's 95. Uh, so, uh, but they're also, it's 95, but they have high ketones still. They have the same ketone levels that they had when they were 80. So it might be 1.8 on the ketones. And so this adaptive glucose sparing is that, well, the muscles don't really need the glucose. They're running fine on fatty acids. So they spare the glucose for the, for the brain, for that 30 to 40% of the brain that's still going to need the uh, glucose. And, uh, but there's also you know, sparing of the ketones as well. And I think that's what I'm seeing. But I, I have not asked these experts about this. But I think what I'm seeing is it's sparing ketones as well because fatty acids the muscles just love it, and they are sparing those ketones as well for the brain or for the heart or for whatever needs it. Does that sound right, guys? I'll just respond that there is something called the dawn phenomenon that's, a, that's associated with the cortisol spike in the morning. And when I presented the, my data, the, not my data, but the data from Gunter Bowden's study, where he put the people in the, with diabetes in the metabolic ward and gave them free access to a high carb diet and a low carb diet. At the end of two weeks, I didn't point it out, but you may recall that the glucoses, where they did them every two hours across the 24 hours, they were highest between four and eight in the morning and then dropped down. They were slightly above normal and then came down into the normal range for the rest of the day. So that is a, if it's a fasting morning glucose, is, is uh, a common observation. Uh, and even in people on, on uh, a well-formulated ketogenic diet, and we see that commonly in people whose diabetes is dramatically improved and their hemoglobin A1Cs are staying down, so we don't worry about it. Actually, and, and I just wanted to add, this is an extremely common. I mean, one of the benefits of having the lean mass hyperspender group and 7,000 members is you get to see what's very common for them, and they tend to be, in my opinion, kind of at the end of the spectrum, per se, given how low a carb they are in what I think is very high uh, metabolic health. It's very common for them to have their fasting glucose in like the mid 90s and even low 100s. But you put a CGM on them and it's as flat as a board, which to me, from, to me from a distance, it looks very much like it's homeostatic, like the body's doing a very good job of keeping it in this very tight delta throughout. You test their fasting insulin and it's often like a two or a three or a four. And I just have a very difficult time thinking that we can apply what we traditionally apply as a quote unquote high fasting insulin, even if it's at the, at the bottom end of the range, to the same population. Because if you look at a, a severe type 2 diabetic population, their fasting glucose is all over the place. It's, and you put a CGM on it, and same thing. You're going to see peaks and valleys everywhere, and you test their fasting insulin, it's going to be through the roof. I don't think these are comparable scenarios systemically. And so that's, again, we don't know what we don't know. We need to have long-term data to feel confident about this. But I do think it's a sparing effect. It just makes the most sense to me. I just want to reiterate, we think that the risk is the product, the multiplication of glucose times insulin. And we saw that in one of the presentations here, so that if the glucose goes up a little bit, but your insulin went way, way, way down, the risk is lower than before. Now she's added a comment. She said it's not just in the morning, it's in the middle of the day, and the A1C is slowly creeping up. Again, also with lean mass hyperspotters, it's not uncommon for them to have an A1C of 5.5 to even 5.9. Okay. Uh, and again, with insulin at the floor, with, the insul with fasting insulin being very low. Now, once again, I'll caveat. That's a hypothesis. We need long-term data to truly know. But it, from a systemic standpoint, I think, again, that makes sense. If you're sparing a lot of the glucose, you're going to have a longer standing circulation of it. Mm -hmm. 
and we do know from other existing studies for which you see a higher resonance of, of free fatty acids within the cells, we know the pathways. You're going to have less GLUT4 expression. So it makes sense that it would be sparing it for the obligate uh, cells, much like red blood cells. Yeah, OK. I think her question is, why is this happening? You're describing a mechanism. And I think Steve and I think Eric would agree with me that, like Steve said, it's carb creep. I mean, I, I would, be, would not be surprised if the carbohydrate intake has slightly elevated. Yeah, just watch that, Millie. Could be that. Right? Okay. I mean, okay. that, that pretty accurate, Steve. I mean, that's a pretty normal uh, behavioral trajectory. Um, time for one or two more, Doug? Okay. Well, what time is dinner, Pam? I want to... <laughs> seven? <laughs> seven? Oh, okay, go ahead. It's 520. <laughs> we still have to do the raffle and then get to dinner. But, um, uh, Dr. Westman, James Greenwald, MD, has a question for you. Have you used the LPIR score yourself? Question mark. Uh, per Dr. James Otvos, who developed the score, is in your neighborhood in Raleigh, North Carolina. And if so, what are your thoughts? Yeah, you know, I've kind of progressed in the clinical practice and watching the studies over time from looking at the lipids and total cholesterol, LDL, that's the old way, triglycerides and HDL, kind of the new way if you just have those four markers. And then I started doing NMR lipoprofiles. There's a couple different ways to look at it, the lipids in an advanced way. One of the companies is based in Raleigh. That's uh, Jim Otvos and the NMR lipoprofile. Interesting recent paper that uh, Brett Schur put up um, was that if that uh, LPIR number or calculation from that specific lipoprofile pattern from the um, liposcience was one of the best predictors of first heart attacks in women. So the higher it was, the, the worse it was. So I, sometimes, so I've progressed now because in many people who do keto, low carb, LCHF for a long time, the small LDL doesn't always go away. So in a clinical practice, I'm not even measuring the lipids anymore. I've moved toward the advanced common sense testing of let's check the arteries directly. So, uh, you know, you can do that. You can, you, you can pay a lot of money for those things, and I, it's not always going to be perfect. And, you know, and then, well, what am I going to do? My small LDL isn't gone all the way. It's down all, and, or my, you know, numbers aren't. I, you don't treat a number, you know, um, in general in a clinical practice. I think that's useful if you want to be reassured that you're going in the right direction. That recent paper really uh, shined on that LPIR as the most important number that comes from that kind of panel, if you do use that. Okay. Um, I think there's at least one more, maybe two, but let me just double check. Oh, uh, this is for Miriam. Could you say more about autophagy and prolonged fasting and treatments for certain types of cancer, or is this not recommended at all in any type? Boy, I wish I knew a lot more about that, but um, I, I think the, the uh, way to get some really good information and, and the science is to listen to a Peter Atia podcast with Eileen White, and she talks about autophagy, and that was the first time that I really understood why my clients who uh, do too much fasting, and it's not from me, it's not coming from me, I do not want them to do this kind of fasting, but they do this fasting or they do a real tight eating window and they do it for autophagy. Well, the cancer cells are, um, the, the metabolic programming within them has switched to, uh, to autophagy all on its own, but it's autophagy to benefit the cancer cell. So those products that become available within the cell are just used as part of the, the cell's process in creating new cells. So it's not a good thing, but I don't really know if it's, I, I suspect that's true with pancreatic, and I suspect that's true with a lot of the gynecological cancers. I do not suspect that's true with glioblastoma or other brain cancers, and I think that's why I see such a profound difference in quality of life and 
um, and other things with people who have brain cancer over the systemic advanced cancers, or even somebody with an early diagnosis of breast cancer, not a stage four, but just a, you know, a stage one, two, uh, they seem to do, they just thrive on, on keto. But I don't see anybody thriving when they're stage four. And I, you know, it's the, it's the nature of the disease, and, uh, but it's, it's heartbreaking to me that I, I have uh, these people that want, you know, my help here, and my advice to them is not do keto. We can do low carb, we can work on other strategies, but you need more protein than you think you do, and, and you know, we, we just need to work on, like, maybe some muscle to pull some of that stuff out of the, the bloodstream. But I think that, that one podcast by Eileen White was a real eye-opener for me, um, because I had, I, I had seen, I didn't know why, but I had seen this was not good, this one meal a day, this four-hour eating window, these three-day fasts. So w even though I still suggest people do fasting around chemotherapy, I want it to be a modified fast. They've got to come into it from a ketogenic state, and I want them to have bone broth and other nourishing things. I want them to have the salt and the fat. Uh, and, uh, and using, you know, Walter Longo's model of maybe eight to 900 calories worth. So this is not a fasting, it's not a true fasting, modified fasting, and they seem to do really well with that. But boy, I don't know, I hope somebody can answer autophagy better than I just did. <laughs> no? Okay. Uh, my, my read on autophagy in a really gross sense is that it's on a spectrum. It's starting to drive the needle a little towards cachexia. What yeah, exactly. That's yeah. what I'm seeing in it, and I don't know yeah. whether that uh, would have yeah, been the that natural seem progression like a good plan. or not. But uh, I, I don't like to see that kind of fasting in older people. I really don't, and that's who I'm talking about mostly. The younger women seem to be able to get through this much better. They can do what they want and not harm themselves. But I see a lot of harm in, because most of the, the women with the gynecological cancers that I'm working with, the advanced stage, they're, uh, they're, you know, definitely they're older. Now, Rainer Clement and his group there in Germany, they did a study, and it was really, it, it, Rainer's very precise about a lot of things, um, well, all of them are, and, uh, and they looked at some very fancy uh, machine that they used for assessing body mass, uh, lean body mass, excuse me, and uh, there, uh, when when they looked at, because they, they, I think what they were trying to do was like, hey, this isn't dangerous, this isn't like a foolish thing to do, even with women with advanced cancers, so we're going to take a look at what this looks like, and the women that were in the ketogenic group, and they were not strongly ketogenic, I think their base level, they were using like a 0 0.3 rather than a 0 0.5 millimole, um, as, the, as the baseline for their consideration of these people who are in ketosis. And he saw, or they saw, I should say, better body composition, you know, uh, more lean body mass retention, less body fat in the ketogenic group than they saw in the, um, in, in, uh, in the control group. And that study was, oh, probably about nine months ago, maybe if I'm to guess as to when that was published, but You'll find it, because it's, it's got a, like a fancy name, and it's definitely about body comp. Uh, and I don't know if Jeff Volick has looked at that in his studies, too, but um, I thought that was like, yes, it's better. It, they're losing weight. They're all losing weight. But if you can retain that lean body mass, that thing that's going to help maintain your, you know, the metabolic regulator in your body, then you're going to be able to repair some of that stuff, even though you're going through the same nasty treatments. In relation to that, you had mentioned in your, during your talk that there are some cancers that have been hinted at or have been confirmed to grow from um, ketones. Could you comment on that? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, the one that I, that, the only one with any science, the only one with any science that I'm going to be, like, consider at all is, um, I think it was Lysanti. And it was uh, a BRAF V600E mutation that's very common in, in melanoma, some types of melanoma, not all melanoma. But you also see it in colon cancer on occasion, very rarely in brain cancer. Uh, pancreatic cancer has that mutation. 
And in the study that they did, they did a cell study, and I don't really care about cell studies, but then they also put this mutation into a, a mouse model. And, the mo and then they infused the mouse model. If I'm, if I'm recalling all the details correctly, they infused it with acetoacetate because in the cell study, that's the thing that had made the cancer grow. So they have this population, this, uh, it, it's not a heterogeneous population of cells anymore. It's one type of mutation that they've put into this animal and then they feed it the thing that they saw, in, and they do it in an unnatural way by infusing it, uh, and they saw progression. But I don't care how, how stilted that study was, it still gives me some concern about uh, being rigorously ketogenic, um, creating, or, or going, chasing that ketone number. I still think there's a huge benefit, and like I said, just think, it's my bias maybe just to think this, I don't have any science on this, that these people are still doing really well if they just go low carb. Everybody with cancer, everybody anywhere, can benefit by just cleaning up their diet. Take out the sugar, take out the starch, take the crap out and make it a healthier diet. So that's when I, I give people that list that I talked about in my, in my talk. It's like, this, these are the foods that can promote health. Eat freely of these. Don't, you know, no, just make, you know, keep up with with your nutrition and eating these, and uh, and I think you're going to gain some benefit um, from that without the downside of, of possibly uh, going, you know, feeding this mutation. But then one of my colleagues, Joy Tan, she's an oncologist uh, with the VA in in Philly, I think in Philly or Pittsburgh, um, and she she did a, uh, a a case series report, published one, three people I believe with uh, melanoma, ketogenic diet, calorie restriction, uh, and the person that did the best was the person with the BRAF V600E mutation. So, uh, so what do you make of that in the real world compared to what was going on in the mice in this highly manipulated environment? That's what it is. When you take a mouse model, you give it this one mutation, and then you infuse, which is never the way you would get acetoacetate. That's one of the ketone bodies, in case you guys are not aware of that. So there's three what we call ketone bodies. There's beta-hydroxybutyrate. That's the one that, that we uh, talk about the most, okay? That one was not feeding this cancer, this, this cancer. Then there's acetoacetate. Uh, that's, the, that's the one that does the conversion that we were talking about in, in the muscle tissue. So that's why uh, P-strips don't work for, forever. That's one of the reasons why P-strips don't work forever, because you're not excreting the thing that P-strix pick up on, which is the acetoacetate, it's being converted into beta-hydroxybutyrate by the muscle. It's part of that adaptation, right, Steve? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so, uh, so you know, I, I don't know what to say. I do know that it's very challenging to work with somebody with, uh, with pancreatic cancer at all, ever, because of the appetite involvement and the digestion issues that they have with any kind of fat. Um, and, uh, but for these other, for like melanoma, I don't, I, I'm still going to work with people. I'm just going to be more careful. It's not going to be rigorous keto. So I hope I answered that person's question. Oh, as far as other mutations, I'm not really worried because, it, like again, in my talk yesterday, I talked about the fermentation of glucose being in the cytoplasm of the cell, being the thing that's creating the most biomass and uh, everything else that goes into the cell, because we're so highly adapted to be able to use a variety of things to keep ourselves, to keep our species alive. So you can get some biomass from amino acids, you can get it from fatty acids, you can also get it from ketone bodies, but nowhere near the level of what's happening when you ferment glucose in the cytoplasm of the cell. So, um, so that's still, there's still a lot of benefit to cleaning up the diet, making that fuel less available for uh, fermentation, not just for the energy for survival, but for this biomass for reproduction.